I'm going to start the introduction by telling a little story that took place at CPAC in 2013. I'll bet several of you were there. It's a conservative political action conference. Many of you were there. You may have seen Mr. Cuccinelli get up and give a speech. And he gave one of these red meat speeches that CPAC crowds love. He stood up on the stage and he talked about the federal government's takeover of the American healthcare system and he said it was flat out unconstitutional. And the crowd got up and they roared, they loved it. And then Mr. Cuccinelli started talking about misguided environmentalism and he called the Environmental Protection Agency the, uh, what did he call it? It was the um, Eliminating uh, Employment, Employment Prevention Agency. That's what it was, sorry about that. And he got that kind of response. Everybody stood up and cheered. Then Mr. Cuccinelli said the following, and I'm going to quote it word for word. He said, how many times have I seen my fellow tough on crime conservatives be not merely willing but excited to lock up every convict and throw away the key. If we really believe that no one is beyond redemption, we need to stop throwing away that key. Conservatives should lead in changing the culture of corrections in America. And then you know what happened? Everybody got up and cheered, just like they did for the other applause line. James Madison uh, believed that government should be limited in all its facets, not some of them. And what I am struck by today is how many of my conservative colleagues think that government can do nothing right until we get to criminal justice, and somehow it can't do anything wrong. And it doesn't take a long look, if you're willing to look, to find things that we don't get quite right. And look, we're humans. We operate in a human system. I think it is the best in the history of the world. But it is still one that is going to generate errors and mistakes. And frankly, we just have to revisit things every once in a while. And so right on crime, uh, who I'm very pleased to work with and have since I left the Attorney General's office, uh, we apply those traditional conservative principles, accountability, a fiscal restraint and responsibility, li truly limiting government power. Uh, but we also think of conservative cultural precepts like personal responsibility, and we don't leave any of them behind. And we apply all those principles to the criminal justice system. Um, and when you also look at high recidivism rates, and these vary by offense and by, lo by state, based on the programs, lots of variety. This is a pass-fail measure. High recidivism equals failure. We are failing. We're not just failing uh, to protect our budgets, but we're also failing to protect our society, and we are failing the individuals who come into this system. And they come into this system because of their choices. They are not victims, they are criminals. But part of what separates us, I hope, is that we don't give up on them. Uh, government is out of control in many ways, and I could go on for a long time about that, but I promise you, you I won't. Um, so you can stay, have the decaf. Um, but um, it, uh, those principles of limited government apply here. They apply here. And I am particularly incensed about regulatorily established crimes. Literally, bureaucrats are turning us into criminals without the accountability of an elected official of any kind. That's why it's good to see a mens rea requirement, just a blanket mens rea requirement imposed. I actually think it would be better not to allow agencies to establish criminal law, period. <laughs> this, this whole expansion is trampling individual liberty, trampling individual liberty. And I, I would also note another sort of uh, area of special concern of mine on the individual liberty front is we talk about being imperfect. Imperfect means we make mistakes. We need to be ready, willing, and able, and frankly enthusiastic to find and admit 
mistakes when we make them. Um, I argued four cases as Attorney General. Two of them were actual innocence cases. That's our Virginia term for once you've been convicted, bringing new evidence that shows that you were actually innocent. The reason it's called that is because you don't get any beyond a reasonable doubt, nothing along those lines. You have to prove that you were innocent as a factual matter. Not make it more likely than not. That's over. That was the trial. And two of my four cases were actual innocence cases. And one of them was of a gentleman who was in prison for 27 years. Who at that time, um, when we won, technically I lost because I was the Commonwealth, but I joined the petition. And we that case ended 6-4 in front of our 10-judge Court of Appeals. 5-5 five, five is a loss. It is literally the closest case I've ever argued. And the reason I know that, I've had other one-vote cases, is because the dissents of the four dissenting votes, three of them wrote fire-breathing dissents. And the, four, the third one said in the dissent, kind of a peek behind the curtain, we all know this case would not be going this way if the Attorney General didn't come in here and ask us to rule this way. I mean, he was castigating the other six, who, by the way, wrote an opinion that long. And that's not a stack of paper. That was on one page. Thanks, guys. But Thomas Hainsworth, after 27 years, was exonerated without DNA evidence. That was why it was so hard. Um, we make mistakes, and we are going to continue to make mistakes, and I believe that needs to be part of how we look at this system. Hi there, Jordan Richardson from Generation Opportunity. Thank you for speaking with us. We've talked a lot tonight about um, an incarceration, and, um, but can you talk about civil asset forfeiture and maybe the effect that that has on between law enforcement officers and the communities they serve? Um, I hate civil asset forfeiture. I mean, I hate it. Um, oh, I'm a, in addition to these topics we're talking about, I'm a rabid property rights guy, and um, uh, obviously those two intersect there. And I also have a very close um, and really affectionate relationship with law enforcement in my state. And this is one of those areas where they drive me nuts. And... Um, because they get the money. Now, mind you, you're talking to the person who got the largest asset forfeiture in the history of Virginia and one of the largest in the history of America for a state, but it was after they were convicted. It's a healthcare fraud case against a drug company, and it was after the conviction. It's the before the conviction that is so horrific. And I mean, you talk about violations of, of, of the principles of liberty. It's hard to find too many in the uh, criminal justice arena that are so badly abusive of individuals um, with so little basis as civil asset forfeiture. Our goal tonight was twofold, to educate you about all the many facets of criminal justice reform, but also to challenge you to do that work in your state. It is a worthwhile effort. It, uh, it does indeed affect the lives of everyone in your community. And I so appreciate, we so appreciate your being here. Thank you, Ken Cuccinelli, for a wonderful address. Thank you. <laughs>